Hey, y'all. My name is Susan Sparks, and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. The title of my sermon this morning is Histories of Grace. A quick note, I will be using a different preaching style than I typically do. Normally I read a manuscript. Uh, uh, today I'm going to be doing extemporaneous preaching that um, <clears throat> I tried out a little bit earlier in the spring, uh, but I wanted to kind of share one of the reasons why I'm trying this out um, as a way of, of walking in and my own history and, and my family's history and legacy of preaching, uh, I wanted to try out this style of extemporaneous preaching. This is the style that my father, my grandfather, um, many, many fa family members who um, are preachers or who have preached, this is the style that they take <clears throat> and approach. So I wanted to kind of try that out. So thank you for um, allowing me the space to do that. And as I continue to kind of figure out my own preaching style and as I grow as a theologian. So thank you for that. Uh, and please join me now and some uh, short prayer. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this community. Um, I thank you just for this opportunity to uh, sing, to read, to pray together, to laugh, to think. I, uh, I pray for this time that you would just be present. God, I, I pray that we sense your presence more. May, may my words be edifying to this congregation and glorifying to you. God, I, I pray that you speak and that we would listen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. History, story, memory, History, books, textbooks, timelines, maps, stories, embellished stories, like the fish story, you know, where it's like, uh, I caught a fish, I caught a crappie, it was this big, and then the next time I told the story, it was this big, it keeps going. <laughs> stories with little detail. Stories not told. Memories. Memories of experiences, collective experiences. Memories of artifacts uh, or names passed down from generation to generation. Traditions. This morning we are talking about history. We're talking about stories and memories of um, our stories, our memories, and, and how that kind of interacts with faith and how we walk our lives, walk through our lives, and, uh, and how we understand the world to be, and how we structure the world. Uh, so this morning it'll be kind of two parts. The first part we're going to be talking about history. This is going to make up the majority of our time this morning. And then the second part we're going to really delve into 2 Corinthians, our, our, our uh, passage in 2 Corinthians this morning and talking about grace and practical steps of, in, in all of this. So uh, to get started into the history section, today uh, this weekend, we are marking the 173rd anniversary of Madison Avenue Baptist Church, which is very exciting. It's cool to look back, look at some of the pictures um, that Brian provided in the e-blast, thank you, Brian, of, of the church in, in different kind of construction uh, form. It didn't have the little coffee rooms. Um, it looked very different. The original church, which is different than the one we have now, um, and recalling the kind of history of, of Madison and looking at where we're at now and where we're going. This week we have also marked another um, important thing that, that we are sitting with this month, which is Pride. Pride is the month where we celebrate and reflect on the history and the life and joy 
of LGBTQIA plus folks, um, where we take pride in who we are. Um, we take pride in how we go about life. It's a time um, to look back, to listen to stories of folks who have come before us, um, to look at what happened at Stonewall um, in San Francisco, in various communities around this nation and this world. And then also this week, we marked the anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, I wanna spend some time talking about the Tulsa Race Massacre um, this morning. First off, um, I am from Tulsa. I grew up, born and raised in Tulsa. And it wasn't until later in high school that I actually heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre. So we're talking about stories and stories told, what's included, what's not included, stories not told. The story of the Tulsa Race Massacre was not told um, in my some of my experiences. So I went through, you know, the Oklahoma history class at freshman year of high school, just like the rest of, you know, my colleagues. And um, that section of the section of the Tulsa Race Massacre was omitted from my syllabus, or you know, for whatever reason, my brother and sister who were a few years ahead of me had had a um, you know a, a project focused on um, Greenwood and went on a field trip and wrote papers talking about you know and understanding trying to understand what happened um, and that wasn't a part of my curriculum and I don't know why it was a story not told so it wasn't until later that I kind of started hearing about the Tulsa race massacre and honestly it wasn't until last year maybe the year before I think last year though that I heard the term Tulsa race massacre see when I had heard it you know the few times I did hear it when I was growing up it was referred to as the Tulsa race riot how we talk about things matters. So a, a riot is very different than a massacre. With a riot, there's kind of a, a blurring of the lines between uh, oppressed and oppressor, between perpetrator and victim. There's a blurring of lines of guilt and responsibility, um, of justification. With massacre, it's pretty clear there was a wrong, the people died, and 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 the fact that it was called and referred to as the Tulsa race riot for so long reflects the broader narrative that, in my opinion, white, white Tulsans created to kind of eschew guilt, eschew responsibility, um, to kind of hide the fact that this was a crime in, in reflection of total depravity, where, where an entire community was destroyed and destroyed to the point and to the, the goal of, of not being able to, to reemerge. Uh, Greenwood was a thriving district of Tulsa. It was um, often referred to as Black, Black Wall Street, excuse me, Black Wall Street. Um, it was a, a community of Black folks who um, took pride in their neighborhood, who had a, a thriving businesses, local Black-owned businesses, um, homes, churches, different community kind of out, out you know, outlets. It was a thriving area. And what happened is just white Tolsons were fed up and found an opportunity to go through and to, to, to kick, essentially kick black folks out and, and, and desecrate this community. And they did. Stories not told matter. 
part of the tragedy of the massacre is is the the many many deaths that happened along with the you know burning down of of the area but there's supposedly a mass grave somewhere i mean there is there has to be um and there's at least enough information to know that there's a mass grave but it hasn't been found stories not told and not passed down that matters how we talk about these things how we talk about the experiences of folks in our community matters. One of the th questions that kind of kept coming up this past year as we've um, really re taken a hard look at race and racism in America, in our, in our community here at Madison, um, our conversations with the Roundtable on Race, um, you know, looking at anti-black racism, anti-Asian hate, and um, the hate crimes that have happened the past year. The, the question that keeps coming up is, okay, what are next steps? What, what can I do? I want to do something, what can I do? One of the things is listening to stories, listening to stories that are not told broadly listening to these experiences of people in our community um, to help kind of unpack this, this step and what it can look like and, and the impact that this small step can have. Um, I wanna bring a resource to your uh, attention. Emily Towns, uh, a womanist ethicist, wrote Womanist Ethics and the Cultural Production of Evil. She is the Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School. And in this, she's talking about memory and counter memory, and it's um, counter memory that I want to focus on here this morning. So um, it's a little wordy. I'll unpack it as we go. So stick with me. Counter memory begins with the particular to move into the universal, and it looks to the past for micro histories, for, for small stories, small accounts to force a reconsideration of flawed histories. So we're looking at the particular, the specific, in order to kind of unpack, to discover flawed histories, flawed narratives, um, flawed broadly held or understood um, cons understandings of what happened. This focus on localized experiences of oppression in counter memory allows us to refocus dominant narratives, touting narrow lenses into a reframing of what constitutes the universal. Okay, that was a little wordy, let me unpack it. So looking at and focusing on these localized experiences of oppression, these small micro histories, allows us to refocus, to change the broadly held dominant narratives, which themselves promote a, a narrow view. Um, so in, in referring to the Tulsa race massacre as the Tulsa race riot, that is um, promoting a, a, a white dominant view of what happened. Um, and by listening to specific stories and accounts and, and hearing from folks in the Greenwood community, it, it allows, uh, in their experiences of oppression, it allows this counter, it's a move of counter memory, and it allows a refocusing of these, these broader narratives. So it leads to referring, it now, referring to what happened as a massacre. Um, Counter memory, this last line, counter memory can open up subversive spaces within dominant discourses that expand our sense of who we are and possibly create a more whole and just society in defiance of structural evil. So counter memory creates this space um, in these dominant narratives, conversations, how we understand our society, um, uh, uh, an experience, a piece of history. It, it creates this space within that 
to expand, and these are the two things, our sense of who we are, and, and secondly, to create a more whole and just society in defiance of structural evil. So it's doing this work of understanding who we are better and, um, and working towards justice. And it's a small step, but it's an important step that creates a space that you know opens up a gap. You know when you when you wedge something in, um, it it in between it, it creates a wider gap, right? That's that's the role of counter memory here. Okay, so we've talked about histories. Uh, we're now in our kind of closing minutes talking about Second Corinthians, our passage here, and um, practical next steps. So Second Corinthians is a book actually that we studied around this time last year, speaking of histories, ha ha ha. Um, in our Bible st adult Bible study, it's, we went through a curriculum by Calvin Rotzel. And one of the key things in here that we talked a lot about in Bible study was an approach to the book of Second Corinthians that looks at uh, it as a series of letters and not necessarily in the order that we have in the book here and kind of uh, rearranging it. And Dr. Rotzel is a proponent of that view as, and it's also a kind of a widely held view of the book um, from biblical scholars. So taking that lens of this book, the, the chapter, little section that we have for our, our text this morning is right in the middle of what's called Paul's defense. So from chapters two to seven is considered Paul's defense. So that's kind of what where we're at and you kind of get a, a little bit of perspective of what's going on. The church of Corinth is not trusting Paul and his leadership. They are questioning him, like how do you actually know that this is the way that we're supposed to go about things? Um, like, why are, you know, who are you? How can we trust that, you know, you're an authority? And Paul is very frustrated. He is the most akin to a frustrated, angry parent. He, he uses actually kind of the, the parental language and, and speak throughout, especially in this defense. And he is trying to work towards reconcili reconciliation between him and the church and hopefully the church and him. And with that is this extension of grace. Paul has sent Timothy and Titus to the church and to no avail. He's, he's told them, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm only admonishing you because I love you. It's for your good. I'm trying to show you the right way to do things, the best way for you, for you. It's out of love. He really clouds his, his arguments in love. And it's like, this is, you know, all out of love. And that's, that's the setup for our text here. So I'll read a couple of verses, starting in uh, verse 13 of chapter four. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. So he's trying to like get us, he's like, hey, we're on the same playing field here. You know, we're, we believe in the same, like in the same God. We believe in, in um, Jesus being raised. We're, you know, this is how we're alike. And then verse 15, yes, everything is for your sake. I love that here. It's parental Paul right here. Uh, I'm doing it because I love you. This is, this is, I know it's hard, but this is the best for you. It's, I'm doing it for your sake. So that, and here's the key, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. The point of it all is that grace, as it extends to people, to your neighbor, to the annoying coworker, uh, to the family member that you haven't talked with, as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. 
We're doing it all for the glory of God. And here's where I, I want to land us today. S verse 16. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For the slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Paul here is talking about life and the precarity of the human experience. Um, we do not lose heart, even though this weird kind of thing about life that as we are living and, you know, we're, we're going about life and we're thriving and, and maybe we're struggling, but maybe we're full of joy as we go about life. Simultaneously, the human experience, we are dying. We are wasting away, as he says here. He's saying, even though we have this precarity of this life and death, and that's how we go about this, this slight momentarily, momentary affliction, but sometimes, honestly, it doesn't feel so slight, right? Sometimes things are overwhelming. But he's point, Paul's pointing the Corinthians, pointing us towards this, this outward focus, to this future focus, to the eternal glory, to the glory of God. Friends, we have talked about histories in the past and how we talk about the past now in the present, how these stories and memories and counter memories affect so much more than just a narrative. They affect our structures of society. They create systems of oppression, um, opportunities for justice. We've talked about the past and, and the, the present. Paul here is talking about the present and talking about how hard it is. It's rough. Do not lose heart. And he's pointing us forward. Do not lose heart. Extend this grace day after day to more and more people. And why? All for the glory of God. I'm wrapping up with a short excerpt from the poem, poem Ulysses um, to close us um, as we look towards the future. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will. To, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Amen. Good morning, Madison Avenue Baptist Church. Once again, this is Richard Binder, your tenor, coming to you from a rare cloudy day in Astoria, Queens. But let's not let that get us down. We can chase those clouds away by singing together hymn number 494. They'll know we are Christians. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. 
And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father, from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, God's only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org. <laughs>